everyone and welcome to the Youth Perspective on CND Day 4. Today was one of the more hectic days I've ever had at CND, which is really saying something. Um, having initially not been accepted for a speaking slot in the plenary, um, I discovered this morning that we had in fact been accepted for a speaking slot in the plenary um, under the agenda item on interagency cooperation uh, within UN bodies. <clears throat> so uh, I frantically wrote a statement this morning, which I'll now read to you. A special thank you to Marie Nugier from IDPC, uh, who at very short notice helped me to proofread this. So we didn't get a recording uh, given the hecticness of everything. So here you are. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me the time to speak today. YouthRise has been engaging in advocacy with various UN agencies, including the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, who I was delighted to see speaking in the plenary earlier today, as well as with UNAIDS in the development of their new Global Aid Strategy. The experiences of youth organisations' participation has been very successful for all parties, with suggested language on youth engagement and ensuring young people are not left behind in the HIV response being adopted in the Global AIDS Strategy. The UN system Common Position on Drugs promotes the active engagement of civil society and local communities, including people who use drugs, women and youth. Unfortunately, the engagement of UNODC with community organisations and in particular young people has so far fallen short of what is needed to reach the ambitious targets set out in the Global AIDS Strategy. While the issue of lack of representation and diversity within the Youth Forum has been raised a number of times by our friends and colleagues in other organisations, I would like to express the urgent need for more youth engagement with the UNODC and at CND, in particular cooperation with UNAIDS to maximise youth engagement, which has proven to be a pr productive tool in reaching vulnerable populations of young people including young people who use drugs. Young people, and in particular, young people who use drugs, are experts in the issues facing them related to criminality and healthcare. Young people deserve to be treated as valued, active, and knowledgeable participants in the policymaking process. Their expertise should not be wasted, and certainly not what we see progress lagging for our community in regards to the HIV response. YouthRise has, for a number of years, been attempting to create a guideline on best practices for service provision for young people who use drugs. This guideline, which would outline the specific and nuanced needs of young people who use drugs in relation to life-saving service provision, has been stalled by a lack of interagency cooperation at the UN level. I call on the UNODC to work closely with other UN agencies including UNAIDS and UNICEF as being particularly relevant to this issue, to improve and increase youth and community engagement in line with best practices currently being implemented by other UN agencies. I would like to end by extending my love and solidarity to the people of Ukraine and all people impacted by Russian imperialism and war around the world. It is vital that we ensure access to harm reduction and other related services for people who use drugs and all key population groups within Ukraine. We must ensure the safe passage of key population groups out of war zones while ensuring continued access to healthcare. We call on all parties of the war and UN agencies to ensure the safe passage of key populations out of Ukraine and safe passage of humanitarian aid into war zones. Thank you. Uh, today I attended an event organized by YouthRise and Women in Harm Reduction International, co-sponsored by SSDP International and with the support of the Norwegian Commission. The session was inspired by a position paper that was developed by Women in Harm Reduction International with inputs from young women with lived experience of problematic drug use. 
Bitrix on behalf of Youth Rise stood in solidarity with people who use drugs in Ukraine and I loved how our panelists uh, stood in solidarity as well by having the backgrounds of uh, their Zoom accounts in the Ukraine flag. Beatrix highlighted the situation in Ukraine, the challenges faced and the initiatives Youth Rise and other communities are doing in response to this crisis, calling out for more support in terms of donation. The position paper which identifies the lack of data and challenges for young women who use drugs uh, was introduced by Ruby. Ruby mentioned how harm reduction services should be tailored to have a gender and age balance to enable young women who use drugs comfortably discuss their issues and challenges openly. Elish, a trans woman who uses drugs, called for people to stand in solidarity with trans and drug communities in Ukraine. She explained the challenges faced by trans women, both with healthcare and law enforcement systems. Elish called out for the decriminalization of people who use drugs and the LGBTQI communities to improve the health and well-being of our communities. The African perspective on young women who use drugs was shared by Rita and she highlighted challenges uh, where which are faced by young women who use drugs. Stigma was one of them, lack of information on drugs, drug, drug use and sexuality was another and lack of the community knowing that SRHR is a law. She called out for SRHR to be factored in harm reduction as a minimum package of harm reduction in every harm reduction center. Marialba talked of how women in the region, that is the Latin American region, experience different kinds of challenges from incarceration. She also talked about uh, drug trafficking by women and where she shared a lot of data of women incarcerated for drug related crimes. Carolina talked of the importance of harm reduction for young women who use drugs and what services and service providers can do to tailor make these services to fit uh, young women who use drugs for them to be able to access uh, healthcare. She mentioned an initiative by Nightlife where they put up posters in bathrooms with anti-harassment and consent messages. Today, of course, I also spoke at our side event. Uh, I spoke about my experiences as a young transgender woman who uses drugs. Uh, I spoke about how these two components of my identity are not distinct from one another. Uh, they intersect and interact with each other in a number of ways um, and they both result in me experiencing stigma and discrimination in wider society uh, whereas in drug using spaces I was experiencing love and acceptance as a trans woman when I first came out. Um, the stigma and discrimination also manifests itself uh, when dealing with law enforcement and public health professionals and in general state actors. Uh, healthcare professionals are unsuited to meeting our needs and uh, law enforcement have very low gender sensitivity uh, levels. Um, the police here in, in Germany are particularly transphobic and uh, right wing. Um, and yeah, whenever I experience harassment or assault, it is suggested that I would call these uh, transphobes in, in uniform to somehow protect me. <clears throat> I also discussed how I'm quite privileged. I'm, I'm white uh, and live in the global north and the gender marker in my passport does not have a huge impact on my daily life, which is not the same for many trans people in a large part of the world. Uh, I spoke about the need to end stigma and discrimination against my community, but uh, also about the need for policymakers and the commission more broadly to take action on these issues. Um, we know what policies will improve the health and well-being of my community, but they're not being implemented. Harm reduction services, gender sensitive harm reduction services, which are easily accessible as well as trans-related healthcare uh, and in general the criminalization of um, people who use drugs and the LGBTQ plus community more broadly ending are all policies which would have a massive benefit for the health and well-being of my community. Despite this evidence pointing towards that, um, there's very little action and in many countries, positive steps are being undone. 
um, in the UK at the moment. Positive steps are being undone for the trans community. Uh, and I finished by quoting Marsha P. Johnson, which is maybe a first for CND. Uh, I'm not sure if that's ever happened before. Uh, or at least paraphrasing Marsha P. Johnson and saying that there is no pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. And that includes the most marginalised communities of both trans women and people who use drugs. So I was happy with um, how the side event went today. Um, and yeah, I feel very privileged and honoured to be able to represent and give a voice to my community, which is not often heard uh, in these sort of debates. Hey everyone, this is Carolina again, and today was the fourth day of the CND. In the morning, in my morning, I participated as a panelist in the side event that we host this year that was about young women who use drugs regarding the position paper that we wrote last year with uh, harm reduction, with women and harm reduction international, sorry. Today has been very insightful, but I think that I will share some very key learnings for me and for the purposes of our work, I think that these points are relevant. One of the first things that stood out for me was on, on the emphasis to limit arbitrary detention to serious crimes and offenses, and then also decriminalize the possession of drugs for personal use. They also shared some very candid gender perspectives in terms of the way women are disproportionately affected by harsh drug laws and policies, and the fact that women also suffer the most um, when they are met with such harsh um, drug laws and policies. I think that another perspective that was shared was mainly on the fact that um, there's the need for urgent decriminalization so that um, drug use is more of an issue of human rights rather than, um, rather than crime. And then also the other highlights I think that stood out for me was also on the call to action where the call to action where there was the response for about collaboration and the fact that the working group on arbitrary detention was ready and available to facilitate the collaboration with other key stakeholders to make sure that um, they are able to counter the existing um, harsh and punitive drug laws to one that is more friendly, one that is more um, human rights oriented, one that is more when they are met with such harsh um, drug laws and policies. I think that another perspective that was shared was mainly on the fact that um, there's the need for urgent decriminalization so that um, drug use is more of an issue of human rights rather than um, rather than crime. And then also the other highlights I think that stood out for me was also on the call to action where the call to action where there was a response for about collaboration and the fact that the working group on arbitrary detention was ready and available to facilitate the collaboration with other key stakeholders to make sure that um, they are able to counter the existing um, harsh and punitive drug laws to one that is more friendly, one that is more um, human rights oriented, one that is more sensitive to the needs of women and young women and all persons that are um, very much affected by the current uh, the current drug laws. So I think that these are some very key highlights that are relevant and essential to our work. We as uh, we as a youth a youth uh, organization and as a harm reduction organization are also open to such partnerships and collaborations to promote our work and also to serve the communities that we work with to the to the grounds and to the barriers minimum. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Neander Julius and uh, today I was able to attend an event at the 64th edition of our CND. Uh, this event was tied to side event was titled the long-term effects of intrauterine exposure to synthetic opioids. So um, what I learned from this event is that for decades the long-term effects of intrauterine exposure to synthetic opioids have been underappreciated. However, now it is known that 9 out of 10 children 
uh, exposed to uh, synthetic opiates while in utero dying. And these children suffer from several problems, especially around their cognitive abilities, problems with their mental, their physical health, and they also suffer from preventable deaths. Um, one striking thing the speakers mentioned is that currently um, there are no pathways for interventions or support for children who suffer from uh, intrauterine exposure to synthetic uh, opioids. Uh, one of the speakers also talked about a cohort study that was done um, that found out that actually children exposed to uh, synthetic opioids while in utero had relatively lower IQs than um, than, 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 than those that were not exposed to synthetic opioids and they were um, three times more um, more likely to be intellectually disabled. Um, one of the speakers talked about um, a neonatal abstinence syndrome which is a cluster of disorders children uh, who are exposed to intrauterine intrauterine um, synthetic opioids uh, that they suffer rather disorders around the language disorders around the behavior about the emotions um, about like, language disorders like autism so and strikingly most of these children do not live beyond their um, 12th birthday so uh, what the speakers recommended as a way forward is this need to to acknowledge that uh, children who are exposed intrauterine to synthetic opioids deserve uh, support and interventions and, and and therefore there's need to cooperate globally and um, to, to to generate and user um, guided uh, end user guided knowledge um, in order to uh, that will an end user guided knowledge that will help to understand, uh, prevent, predict, and protect children exposed to um, synthetic product, uh, synthetic uh, opioids while in utero. Um, thank you. I participated uh, as a viewer of another side event organized by Mexico Unido contra la Delincuencia with the support of Mexico and the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation, Elementa de Derechos Humanos, the HIV Legal Network, and the IDPC. This side event had uh, all women panelists, which, is, which was very, very cool. And it was uh, moder its moderator was Juan from IDPC. And the panelists were from Canada, Colombia, and Mexico. The panelist from Canada, she spoke about human rights at the center and reducing, for reducing criminalization. There is also, she said, a confusion between decriminalization and supply, and the consumption in the underground is increased risk for young people who use drugs because they are very scared to attend health services because they are afraid to be uh, put in jail because of that. So she said that summarizing a lot she said that uh, this is why we should decriminal decriminalize sorry um, possession of drugs for personal use the other panelist was Adriana Murano from Elementa de Derechos Humanos and she explained a little bit about the Colombian experience she said that criminal policy that has affected has affected sorry the lives of thousands of vulnerable people in different parts of the world. She spoke about how to incorporate the human rights approach in drug policy and how the criminal justice system has disproportionate responses for young people and for people who use drugs in general. She spoke about also about the multiple attempts to recriminalize personal possession in Colombia. And she finally said that decriminalization policy has to transcend governments because it must be a, uh, it must be accompanied by public health and access to information and harm reduction programs. Last but not least, uh, we had Frida Ibarra from Mexico Mexico Unido contra la, eh, la delincuencia, and she also spoke about how the criminal justice system does not have the same impact of the major drug traffickers and it does on minors. She said also that it's very necessary to improve the allocation of resources and health and human rights programs has to be in line with institutional standards. She also spoke about depression, overpopulation and incarceration 
as a problem in Mexico, but not only in Mexico, but also in, in most parts of Latin America. She said also that she was very concerned about the most extreme, um, the most extreme sorry, measures of the state to deal with drug issues, and, and it was totally irrational because they put a lot of violence and a lot of resources of people who have maybe drugs for its personal consumption, for its, its personal use. Sorry, we I use consumption because in in Spanish we 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 said consumir, which is consume instead of using, which is usar. So that's why I always get confused with those words. Um, basically, this side event was very interesting. Decriminal, decriminalization is something that we should all be paying a lot of attention, and it's not about just regions of the world, it has to be uh, worldwide. So that's why I think these kind of side events are very important and we have to attend to them, not only on, on, on the CND. The organization International Dianova or Dianova International is an NGO committed to social progress that supports the development of programs and projects aimed at improving people's lives on four continents. It also defends people's interest in the fields of health, equality, and social inclusion. During the 65th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, Dianova presented the panel Children and Families Affected by Parental Drug Use, Curing Gaps and Promising Practices, which was focused on highlighting the experiences of children with drug use in parents, main challenges and recommendations for a positive approach for all parties involved. The situation of children of people having a problematic use of alcohol or other drugs is an issue that has not yet received the attention that it deserves. Many issues have yet to be addressed. The implementation of a children's rights perspective in addiction services, the design of a specific pre prevention programs, or the need for a better cooperation between services, among others. On the other hand, children affected by parental substance use face additional risk compared to other children. They are more likely to develop health, social, physical, and psychological problems, and parents with a problematic use of alcohol and other drugs may have difficulties in fulfilling their responsibilities towards their children due to their situation of social vulnerability that can directly impact the quality of life of children. Addiction services such as harm reduction or treatment programs have proved effective in addressing the needs of people who use drugs. However, it is not clear whether or not they are capable of providing clients' children with the interventions that they need. Some services implement proposals aiming at better responding to the needs of clients' children by increasing parents' parenting abilities and by supporting children through regular therapy sessions dedicated to fostering their emotional and intellectual development. It should be noted that these services could also implement support programs for pregnant women who use drugs and prevention programs for adults and adolescents within educational treatment and settings. Dianova also conducted a survey to gather information about how children's needs are being addressed in addiction services for adults. For further information, you can visit their whole publication on the website dianova.org. Reporting day three on CND side event titled Operational Activities Training and Prevention Projects Carried Out by Law Enforcement and Fight Against Narcoterrorism Organized by Turkey, Ministry of Interior, uh, Police Counter Narcotics Department, and Gendarmerie uh, General Command with the aim to give a general overview of Turkey's multidisciplinary experience and the best practice in terms of operational activities, training and prevention pro uh, projects and fight against narco-terrorism carried out by uh, national law enforcement agencies. Uh, the sessions started with the presentations on how the structure of police counter narcotics department is and latest development in uh, national international operations conducted against uh, drug trafficking with uh, uh, 35 international operations on 18 different countries starting from 2015 till 2022. The event also talked about the national narcotics training and its prevention projects. It also talked about the gendarmerie, 
armed law enforcement organizations which maintain security and public order applying uh, modern law uh, enforcement methods to fight against uh, smuggling and organized crimes uh, with the ability to operate uh, internationally. Uh, the sessions also talked about the concept of uh, narco-terrorism, uh, saying it's a crime that includes the participations of groups or associated uh, individuals in taxing, uh, providing security for or uh, aiding or abetting, assisting drug trafficking, attempting uh, attempts so as to uh, promote or fund terrorist activities. Uh, many crimes uh, types are uh, committed to providing finance for terrorist activities while illegal drug manufacture and trafficking have been important part among all cr criminal activities uh, in Turkey. And national law enforcement agencies of Turkey briefed uh, about their activities in the fight against illicit drug trafficking and financing of uh, terrorism as crime against uh, humanity. Uh, the session was quite uh, new for me and revealing and interesting and fascinating and I enjoyed the session. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Leander Julius and today at my second event at the 65th edition of the CND was responding to drug related challenges in cyberspace and uh, the vulnerabilities and the opportunities uh, uh, to engage civil society. This event was organized by the UNDC Civil Society uh, unit uh, with uh, support from of, of Switzerland. Um, what I learned from this event is that uh, currently there is an increase in, in there's an increase in, uh, in in online drug trade being uh, facilitated by the crypto market and uh, um, internet pharmacy is the main big source of um, is a big source of um, counterfeit and illicit drugs in, on the market that is in India and the internet has gone ahead has saved the illicit and uh, illicit economies by widely expanding the customer base, lowering the barriers of entry for supply and demand, and enabling greater anonymity uh, and access to new uh, recruits for employment and victimization. Uh, one of the speakers talked about um, uh, the role of civil society in responding to organized uh, crime. Uh, he says that communities need to be um, made a partner in building safe spaces where people can grow, live, and work. And this requires an investment in the growth and the protection of civil society actors of all kinds, and, uh, including the NGOs, the advocacy groups, uh, religious groups, the media, the journalists, um, in order to bring back uh, the public perspective into political and uh, economic discourse. Uh, one of the uh, facilitators, speakers, talked about uh, the vulnerabilities and opportunities uh, here and says that uh, we have to, uh, uh, it has been found out that there is a need for more partnerships, there is need for awareness raising, there is need for focusing on the most uh, harmful substances and uh, platforms. Uh, in order to reduce harm alongside um, law enforcement and regulation and in order to take this forward um, while gathering research and data communities including people who use drugs must be involved um, it cannot just be done by um, by uh, from it cannot just be taken from official data uh, however civil society must be protected and supported while they engaged in building resilience. Thank you. Recording. Quite surprisingly, one of the most controversial and most um, fiercely debated items in the plenary um, this week at CND has been around budgetary and administrative questions, particularly on the election of a member to represent the Eastern European group, group in the financial governance body. 
of um, of the um, CND. Um, so basically, this is the body that takes care of the administrative and financial issues of the commission, and um, they have different representatives for the different regional groups, uh, just to make sure that um, you know there there's enough um, like regional representation. And there was a nominee by the Russian Federation, and then Latvia also put forward a candidate. So, kind of opposed to the other regional groups, there was actually um, a competition here. Um, and Russia first uh, wanted to postpone this vote from this week until December. Um, they they put forward a motion for this on Tuesday. Um, but this was voted down because obviously this financial governance body needs to be functioning in order uh, for the entire commission to be able to do its job, which is throughout the year. It's not just this one week um, during um, the regular session, but they, they have worked throughout the year. So if the vote uh, to elect a, a representative was postponed to December, then it was really, really unclear how the commission could function. Um, so the vote did happen today on Thursday, um, and there were quite strong speeches delivered ahead of the vote from both the Russian Federation and Latvia. Um, the Russian Federation was basically very, very upset that a candidate has been put forward by Latvia. They were arguing that their candidate is more qualified, um, but also that um, Latvia and other countries who are supporting the Latvian candidate are breaking the rules of procedure because the candidate was put forward uh, quite late. Um, so obviously this again went into more of the um, geopolitical issues regarding the war in Ukraine, which have been uh, very dominant uh, this week at CND, understandably. Um, and we did hear rumors that part of why the Latvian candidate was put forward is because there was a lack of trust in the Russian candidate because of how Russia has been interacting with other member states of the CND, but, but, but the United Nations in general. Um, so basically the Russian Federation was very upset that this war is going forward. Um, and they were arguing that there are going to be a lot of um, negative consequences for the functioning of the CND and other technical bodies of the United Nations if this anti-Russian strategy of um, electing the Latvian representative actually happens. Um, and then the ambassador um, or the representative of Latvia delivered a very, very strong speech. Uh, basically, um, and I'm gonna quote a few lines from it. Um, she was saying that, I believe that a representative of a country whose credit rating has been downgraded to C minus, minus, minus because of the war it is waging against Ukraine would not be the best advisor on financial matters and consolidated budget of UNODC. I believe that a representative of a country that heavily miscalculated its capacity in the war against Ukraine would not be the best advisor on evaluation and oversight in UNODC. I believe that a representative of a country that is being more and more isolated because of its aggression against Ukraine would not be the best advisor on implementation of regional and global programs. Um, so that's part of a quote, and, and you can read the entire statement on the CND blog. It was quite strong, and um, I think the statement finally did what uh, a few of us following the CND from Youth Rise and other civil society organizations were kind of missing um, from all of the statements that the member states have been making regarding the war in Ukraine, um, which is, and, and, and that's something that Russia has been calling out all week. Um, these statements basically gave a, and I'm not saying it's a legit foundation, but it gave like an arguing ground to Russia to say that all of these issues are irrelevant to the work of the CND. And obviously we know that it's not, um, if you're violating international norms, it's very difficult to, for, for anyone to, to work 
together with you um, in, in another international forum. Um, but what the Latvian representative did in this speech is um, tie a lot of the issues with Russia's recent conduct, con conduct both within the CND and outside of it to actual issues related to the work of the CND. So yeah, it's it, it finally did that. Um, and I, I think it was really beneficial um, to keeping the work going for the week. Um, and then the vote went ahead and the Latvian representative was elected uh, with a very decidedly big uh, majority. Um, which the Russian Federation was was not happy about. Um, they said that um, this kind of support um, is, is equal to the glorification of Nazism um, and, and a lot of those rhetorics that um, unfortunately we've heard before a lot of times in a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, they just kept arguing that this is neglecting the rules of procedure. Um, but this is actually something that um, the chair of the CND has also been alluding to this week is that what the Russian Federation usually does very well at CND is to keep bringing up the rules and regulations when it's convenient for them. And this is actually what Russia does a lot of the time in other international forums. Uh, they keep sticking to the rules, they keep demanding accountability and adherence to the rules by other countries when it's convenient for them, um, but, but they also ignore, blatantly ignore the rules when they want to. And I'm not saying that it's the Russian Federation is the only country that does this in the, in the international sphere. Uh, that's far from being the case, but in this particular situation, I think it's important um, to note um, that what we're seeing this week in the CND is, is a very interesting um, example of very peculiar interpretation of both international agreements and both the functions of different bodies of the United Nations, such as the CND.